Our first guest is the author of the poetry collection From the Belly from Sibling Rivalry Press 2012. She has been a Pushcart Prize nominee for poetry and her work is forthcoming in hypertext and has appeared in Fifth Wednesday Journal, Cider Press Review, Gargoyle, Spoon River Poetry Review, Cloud Bank, Poet Lore, and Pebble Lake Review, Wicked Alice, and other journals and anthologies. She is a senior editor with Rhino Poetry and an adjunct professor of English at Loyola University, Chicago, and DePaul University School of Continuing and Professional Education. Please welcome Virginia Bell. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ethan and Kyle. Yeah. It? And thank you, Kyle. <laughs> and that's not written in. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming out. This is really a thrill for me. I'm not reading poetry, um, so this is particularly exciting for me. I'm reading from a memoir I'm working on, which is called Vivarium, A Natural History of the Ten Years I Knew My Father. And I told uh, Eden to think of it as a cross between Alice and Bechdel's Fun Home, if you know that, any Fun Home fans, yeah. and Charles Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle. <laughs> I'm reading a really short excerpt, just a little nibble from the opening of the first chapter. Fish. He went fishing for trout and compliments. A figure of speech called Zeugma. American pronunciation, Zugma from the ancient Greek for yoking together, for yoking the literal truth for trout to the idiomatic for compliments, for when you want to say two different things at once, or for when you want to be or do two things at once, when you just want to let things rest, but you also want to ferret out the truth, a truth anyway, when you want to be able to move seamlessly and swiftly like a line in a poem, from one place thought and image to quite another place, thought and image, to move as fish do. One summer when I was a kid, we went to Ocean City on a rare vacation with our mother. Our parents had been divorced, and we only went on camping trips with our father. But our mother had been saving and finally had enough money to take four kids to the Maryland shore, a long one-day drive from western Pennsylvania in her used Volkswagen. We stayed in a two-story budget motel a few hot blocks from the public beach. Mother liked to walk on the beach with her eyes downcast, scanning for a find, dropping to her knees now and then and raking through the sand for pink shards or whole shells, intact but yellow, like white linen exposed to sunlight. My oldest brother sat with his feet in the soft, wet sand at the edge of the surf, reading Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land. My other brother body surfed, looking for rougher and rougher water to throw himself into. My older sister slathered her bikini-clad body with Hawaiian tropic oil and lay on the frayed towels we had brought from home. I didn't last the week. My skin popped and buckled in the sun. At night, it sloughed off in lacy strips. After two days, I was allowed to stay in the motel room alone. Once a day, the maid came in with her minty, tapered cigarettes, you've come a long way, baby. I was scared at first, retreating to the corner of one of the two double beds with my knees pulled up to my chest like a snail retracting its muscled foot. I watched the ashes fall from the cigarette between her lips onto the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting as she vacuumed. They fell just behind the cleaner's drag, landing still and quiet as mouse pellets. What? You never seen anyone smoke before? I shook my head no, then yes. You want to try it? She brought her cigarette over to me, held it out just above my knees, and when I didn't do anything, held it to my mouth, the smoke drifting to my eyes and smelling faintly like old toothpaste. After the second day, she turned off the vacuum, sat with me on the bed, and watched soap operas with the sound turned down very low or old Elvis movies. We both leaned against the headboard with our legs stretched out before us, our eyes glued to the lip quiver, hip swivel body of the man on the screen, a man who moved like a fish, sang and danced as if underwater. 
a man unlike any men I knew. Not like my father, for instance, back in Pennsylvania doing I had no idea what. Or at least not like the parts of himself he showed to the world. The last day, the maid stayed so long she was getting late to the other rooms. She heard someone call her name and jumped up quickly, rushed to the hallway, then ran back in and threw clean towels into my small hands. I closed the door, then pushed their harsh perfume into my raw face. Tsukma. Like paradox, but harder to say. Coarse, but more surprising. Paradox, to know, but not know enough. To recall, but imperfectly. To honor and feel ashamed of. To forgive, but judge harshly. To long for and stave off. All these things I feel for family. My father died of a heart attack when I was 10 years old which means that he's a relatively unimportant figure in my day-to-day -day life, like someone I met several times when I lived in another city, but with whom I lost touch. He was a religious white man, a missionary. He was a scientist. He was also a closeted gay man. I will never know how he would identify himself now or how he regarded himself in his brief lifetime. He's a character in a foreign film whose title I don't remember. He picked us up around dinner time on Friday evenings and drove us the 45 minutes down Highway 30 to his apartment in another town. Highway 30 was a truck route, even though it had stoplights and was lined with fast food restaurants and newly built strip malls. Every so often we would pass a runaway truck run, a dirt road that suddenly veered right and up into the side of a steep Pennsylvania hill. If a truck's brakes failed, the driver could use the run to slow his rig down and avoid disaster. Even on these short trips, my father played 20 questions with us, or taught us to sing American folk songs in rounds. <clears throat> Excuse my singing voice. White coral bells upon a slender stalk. Oh, don't you wish that you could hear them ring? That will only happen when the fairies sing. When we entered my father's apartment, I was eager to see the one fish that was considered mine in his three large aquaria. I had named her Caddy because she was a catfish, not that I knew if she was female or male, and she lived below purple and green neon tetra and glamorous angelfish alongside slender plant, plants and painted plastic castles. I crawled across the carpeting to the tanks and then slowly rose from my knees until I could see the blue gravel that lined their floors. From there, I pressed my nose into the glass and watched Caddy, snapping a series of close-ups on her movement, her incremental progress across the gravel. She was gently sucking, her tiny wet whiskers moving in slow motion. She lived in her own private and impossible world, half land, half sea, half walking, half swimming, Part mammal, it seemed to me, part fish. She was a tool, a tiny vacuum, as much as a living thing. All she heard were the bubbles from the pump that oxygenated her world. The fish world above her was unimportant, unnoticed. The human world on the other side of the glass, unthinkable. To move as some fish do, to be in their world and feel it, to have access to the inaccessible, to be transformed by it. We have only our imaginations to rely on. Like the poet Jack Gilbert's fish, swimming upriver from the sea and the sea's grand rooms fading from their flat eyes. In the United States, freshwater catfish species are known by a variety of slang names. Mudcats, pollywogs, chuckleheads, they're negatively buoyant. They don't float as well as regular fish. They have no scales. They're naked. About half of all catfish species are sexually dimorphic. Some females, for example, are able to modify the anal fin into an intromittent organ, one that can enter or penetrate an orifice. They are also bottom feeders, some detritivores, who scavenge for dead material, like carnivorous writers. <laughs> Think of Elizabeth Bishop's fish and the five big hooks grown firmly in his mouth, but she let him go. 
or Mary Oliver's fish who flailed and sucked at the burning amazement of the air. She ate him, opened his body, and separated the flesh from the bones. Some of the camping trips with my father were for men and boys only. He came to pick up my brothers one summer morning, and I watched them climb into his blue Ford Torino with the trunk and rooftop luggage carrier stuffed to the gills with sleeping bags and fishing poles, tackle boxes, coolers of food, lanterns, and a Coleman stove. They were headed to the Boundary Waters near Canada to rent canoes, portage, sleep under the stars, and learn to fish for their own supper. I stood red-faced with my hands on my hips on the stoop of my mother's house. I'm coming, I demanded. My father reached down, tickled me under the arms until I had to give up my stance. Not this time, little chickadee, he smiled. No girls allowed. And they were gone. Collecting marine life and small animals became popular in Victorian England. Naturalists constructed vivaria, boxes with only one side of glass, like a Joseph Cornell diorama, to house and display their live collections. They soon constructed aquatic vivaria with four walls of glass and a cast iron frame elevated on ornate iron legs to show off their freshwater and marine specimens. In 1854, naturalist and lay Methodist preacher Philip Henry Goss published The Aquarium, an unveiling of the wonders of the deep, coining the term we still use today. Goss's obsessions were made possible by colonial adventure. He went to Canada as an entomologist and Jamaica as an ornithologist. Since the British Crown abolished slavery in 1834, technically he did not have slaves. But in Jamaica he did have assistance in the form of black men, Moravian Christian converts. My father also pressed flowers and ferns into Bibles. He lived and collected in places that had been part of the British Empire, India, Pakistan, and part of the US American Empire, the Philippines. I don't know if he had any native assistance, but I can only assume he did. Long after he died, I heard the story of my father's skinny dipping in the boundary waters. He and my brothers had canoed all day and in the late afternoon came ashore to camp for the night. As they were securing the canoes, they heard whooping and hollering from the small island in the middle of the lake across from them. The men on the shore of the island were diving in the water, swimming a little, but mostly horsing around, dunking each other, pulling each other under, laughing and splashing. The sun was a low red ball meeting the land behind them, so it was hard to tell, but it looked like they might have stripped bare. Their torsos shot up every now and then, like the pale, slick bodies of dolphins or the furred pelts of otters, then twisted back down and out of view. Come on, kidlins, my father shouted at my brothers. But dad, my brother said doubtfully. Then he pulled his shirt up over his head, pulled his trousers and boxers down, threw them all on the sand, and dove in the water to start swimming across to the men, who were complete strangers. My brothers watched until it was too dark to see anything across the water, then turned their backs, built a fire from the kindling close at hand, and finished setting up camp. They primed the lantern and the stove, cleared a soft area of stray sticks and stones, unrolled the sleeping bags, and waited for our father to swim back. It seemed like a very long time. That's it.